I'm here today with John Kay, columnist for the Financial Times, visiting professor at London School of Economics, and the author of Obliquity, now about to be released in the United States on Penguin Press. John, thanks for being here today. Thank you, Rob. So, tell us, what, what, are, what are you telling us in this book? <laughs> Obliquity is the idea that complex goals are often best pursued indirectly. And the result of that is that the happiest people are not the most aggressive in the pursuit of happiness, whatever the founding fathers of your country may have had to say about it. Uh, the most profitable companies are typically not the most profit-oriented, and the wealthiest people are not actually the most materialistic. Why, why is there such indirection? What, how do you, how do you uh, that? It, it is a paradox, isn't it? And one of the ways I encourage people to think about is to take the rather remarkable story of the spacecraft, the messenger spacecraft, that NASA's just put into orbit round about Mercury. And although Mercury is only, I say only because we're getting used to large numbers with the bank bailouts and so on, is only 50 million miles from Earth, uh, the space shuttle, the spacecraft has actually traveled five billion miles in order to get there. That's a hundred times as much. And it's orbited the Earth once, Venus twice, and Mercury three times before it's actually reached its destination. And if you ask why they've done that, when you start thinking it through, you can see the direct approach doesn't work. If you fire a rocket straight at Mercury, uh, then either you hit Mercury which is not a lot of use if you want to photograph it, or your spacecraft travels straight past Mercury and disappears somewhere into the, out into the solar system. You can only approach this goal by achieving it indirectly. Well, you wouldn't want to uh, rob the salesman of being able to sell the used spacecraft on the lot after this is over. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But there's something else that's worth noticing about this, which is that NASA uh, were actually able to do this. They weren't sure they could do it, but they have. Uh, and the reason they were able to do it is that they, seven years ago, when they launched the craft, it took seven years to reach its orbit of Mercury. Seven years ago, when they launched the craft, they knew more or less exactly where Mercury was going to be in uh, March 2011. Now, if you think about it, we don't often have that kind of certainty about the future. In fact, in the world in which we occupy, we have that certainty about hardly anything except the motion of the planets. Well, given the uh conflicts we're experiencing about uh, fiscal policy and stimulus programs in both the United States and the UK right now, uh, it seems that the, uh, what you might call, quality of the model or precision that economists have uh, would never get us anywhere near a remote planet. Falls a long way short of that, it does. And it goes on because the reason we can do that is that we know more or less exactly what the uh, equations that govern the motion of the planets are. We've known that for a long time. So that although the system is a dynamic one, like an economic system, the dynamics of it are completely determined in advance. And that means we know not just where Mercury will be in seven years' time, we know where Mercury will be in a thousand years' time. Again, that's not something we can expect to, to know in the field of business finance. And there are two other characteristics as well. One is that that system doesn't change. We know all we need to know about it, and it does it right, and there aren't things that come from outside our solar system and change in expected or unexpected ways uh, the direction of travel. And the other characteristic is the system isn't changed by our interaction with it. That is, the, the spacecraft used Venus, the Earth, and Mercury itself to kind of break and accelerate, but that didn't affect the motion of these planets themselves. And if it had, 
the whole problem would have been orders of magnitude more complicated to the point of being essentially unmanageable. It's like the bailouts it's having no effect on the perceptions <laughs> of people about the integrity of their government. <laughs> you might think <laughs> And the point of this, as you can see, is, is to s demonstrate how restrictive the conditions are to be able to treat a system in this kind of way. And we're not within miles either of being able to do that about the economic systems we have to deal with or expecting we could ever be able to deal with economic systems in this sort of way. It's the extraordinary kind of hubris to people of people who believe that they can model the macroeconomy in the kind of ways that NASA is able to model the motion of the planets and the orbits of their spacecraft. At some level, as a uh, as a navigator or a ship's captain, you're only as good as the quality is of your maps and charts. Yeah. And the economic charts don't seem to keep the ship off the rocks, at least in 2008. And uh, whereas this spacecraft can be guided with such precision, uh, I think you're you're illuminating by showing that example what economics isn't able to uh, yeah. achieve. And that's actually a useful analogy with maps and charts, because what a map or chart is, is basically it's this kind of simplification of a complex system that you use for navigation. And we've always got to proceed by, by simplification. And uh, we don't know whether the particular simplification we have chosen is appropriate for a particular problem or not, except by experience. I have a, a, a rather nice example in the book, I think, of uh, using the London tube map, which, as anyone who's visited London knows, is a rather brilliant piece of design. But this is a story of how I believed that uh, uh, I was choosing the quickest way to go to by tube, by subway, between two, uh, two, des two, two points only to discover that what was half an hour's journey on the subway is a five minute walk if you actually look over ground instead of underground. The point is that the, the London tube map is a great model, but it doesn't actually accurately replicate the terrain of London, and it wouldn't be a great model if it did. But you have to use the right model for a particular purpose. And you can only do that by being able to import general knowledge from outside the model into the problems we're trying to use economic models for. I do know uh, John Maynard Keynes once wrote Roy Herod a letter where he said that the ability to make models and understand them and so forth was one skill, but the ability to choose models that were right for circumstance was a much rarer skill that very few economists uh, embodied. Yes, there's another famous letter by uh, Keynes uh, where he described a conversation with, with Max Planck, the great Nobel Prize winning physicist, and he said that Max Planck had said to him that he, Planck, had thought of taking up economics but decided not to because he thought it was too hard. <laughs> and Keynes went on to explain that that clearly wasn't because uh, Planck didn't think he could do the mathematics. What he went on to say was that Planck's doubt about doing economics was that he was skeptical about whether the approach that worked in physics, which was from a set of axioms to deduce the very extended consequences of these particular axioms and assumptions, whether that skill was appropriate in an economic world in which you could never be certain of the relevance of any particular group of, of axioms to any particular problem, that the fundamentally deductive method of, uh, uh, methods of, of physics were not appropriate to a more applied science in which inductive reasoning was often more appropriate. And I think we ought to learn that lesson in the way we approach the subject today.
at some level, thinking of it like an engineer would talk about feedback, the inductive approach assumes less structure and samples more frequently now, for course corrections and, and can make fewer, we say, big and bold claims as a result. And actually, if you think about that in relation to how we know these equations of the solar system, if we go back in history of that, we had, as it were, the Greek philosophers and mathematicians and the Catholic Church who had essentially deduced the motion of the planets from their axioms that we were the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. And the way it got off overturned was in the first instance by the mass of detailed astronomical observations which were made by Tycho Brahe, whose interests were simply entirely in accumulating data. And then it was when his assistant Kepler started to work through this data that he made conjectures about the equations that actually explain this data. And then, of course, as we, uh, as we all know, Galileo and others you know, made empirical experiments in the sky to see right whether Kepler's equation predictions were right and found they were verified. And I still treasure, I don't know if you've seen, there's a moment in Brecht's play Galileo in which the inquisitors refuse to look through Galileo's telescope on the grounds that the church has decreed that what he sees can't be there. <laughs> and actually, if I think about the way some of the economists who believe in rational expectations have reacted to the events of the last few years, I'm often reminded of the inquisitors who refused to look through Galileo's telescope because they knew on a priori grounds that what he saw wasn't there. <laughs> That's wonderful. Tell me, where, where did the inspiration for this book come from? It's an interesting history. It, go, it goes back to the 1990s when I was doing some work on ICI, which, as you know, was for most of the 20th century, Britain's largest and successful industrial company. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, the history of ICI was one in which it uh, the, the company had... Uh, begun from a specialization in dye stuffs and chemicals, had moved to petrochemicals and agrochemicals when that became a, a more interesting line of business. And then in the 1940s, after the Second World War, the senior executives of ICI took the, as it turned out, rather far-sighted view that uh, the future of applying chemistry to business, lay in pharmaceuticals and set up a pharmaceutical division. Now that pharmaceutical division lost money for the company for 20 years. And that, that was instructive because I don't think very few companies, the kind of financial pressures that the market now places on companies, would be able to do that kind of thing. But in the end, the pharmaceutical division of ICI became by far the most valuable part of the whole company. Now the pharmaceutical division took off when in 1960s a group of chemists in ICI led by James Black discovered beta blockers which are the, were the first effective drugs against hypertension. But interestingly after that discovery Black left ICI and he went and joined another British drug company at the time, Smith Klein French, where he discovered another blockbuster drug, a quite different one, called an anti-ulcerant drug called Tagamet. That was actually the first drug to be of any use in, 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 in that area. And then, actually, as a result of Black's discovery there, a third British company called Glaxo, which was a small struggling pharmaceutical company at the time, refocused its research program and came up with a, a somewhat imitative drug for Tagamet, which did much the same job but rather better. And Zantac, which they created, actually became for a time the best-selling drug in the history of pharmaceuticals. 
Now, reason, when, so in a sense, Black's discoveries were the foundation of the British pharmaceutical industry, which in many respects is the most successful British industry since the Second World War. But I was interested in the question, why did Black actually leave ICI? And I went to talk to him about it, and he said, well, it's easy enough. Management of ICI wanted me to go on road shows to sell Tagamat, whereas what I, whereas to, to, to sell beta blockers, whereas what I actually wanted to do was discover new drugs. So I went to a company that let me do that. And then he looked at me and laughed and said, uh, you know, I think uh, I used to tell my colleagues in ICI that if they wanted to make money, there were many easier ways of doing it than pharmaceutical research. And he shook his head and said, how wrong could I have been? <laughs> and he finished by saying, I think of it as the, the principle of obliquity, that very often complex goals are best achieved by not achieving, by, by not pursuing them directly. And that exchange and that example, you know, stuck in my mind, you know, ever since. And uh, that's why I titled, you know, this book, Obliquity, and why I've been thinking about examples in, in other ways. And there's a really important lesson for business generally in all of that, which is that um, the most profitable companies are not necessarily the most profit-oriented, because actually the success of pharmaceutical research depends on, depends entirely, in fact, on having people like Black come up with these, uh, these discoveries. And what the, the, the profit-oriented, the more profit-oriented management had failed to do, you know, was to give the sense of purpose that actually achieved that result. And that's what a number of people have called the kind of profit-seeking paradox, that the way to become profitable is not necessarily to be the most aggressive in pursuit of profits. And Bear Stearns, as we know, had this famous sign on the trading floor saying, we make nothing but money. And in the end, they, they finished up not making that. Yeah. Well, John, the, uh, I don't know what to, how we say, uh, follow on the next stage of the book or what kind of uh, title is in your imagination right now. But I think uh, this is a very thought-provoking concept that you've brought to bear and uh, certainly good what you might call anti-hubris inoculation yeah. for <laughs> economists. And uh, I want to thank you for joining us here today. Good. Thanks, Rob. <laughs>